I'll sum it up. The students are kind of. <laughs> I'll go and let them in. <laughs> they got to go to the back. They don't know. They just. Oh. Guys, <laughs> help yourself to water, coke, whatever. Just help yourself. It's for you guys. We put that on the other screen. Yeah. You can close it. Or close it. Yeah. Close it. Yeah. Uh, no, that's minimize the next one. Okay. Our graduate, he's doing PhD now, but he won the ASHRAE competition, yeah. the next level. He was the team leader. He's doing PhD now. Oh. Don't matter because he's not doing yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 he's wow. All the but he's going to talk to you. Are they doing? Focusing on energy resilience. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, and we're going to give us a broader like, look at energy systems and that. And we'll going in on top of it. Okay. Good. It is on the right, but look at the And then we talk to each other. Yeah, but it's the supervisor yeah. of course, the administration. I ask him to stay and he works. Yeah, 
guys uh welcome to this uh evening um so we have a combined event with the ashley uk chapter and since the east midlands uh so i'd like to uh, introduce uh the speaker uh daryl boyce so uh he's a fellow and life member of ashray and was the ashray president uh society president for 2020 2019 and 2020 and one coincidence was i received the ashray student competition award from Daryl Boyce in uh, 2020 Winter Conference. Uh, so yeah, he has also served previously on the board of directors of ASHRAE. And uh, Boyce is retired and uh, was previously a special advisor to the vice president, uh, finance administration as assistant vice president of facilities management uh, at uh, Carlton University in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, so through his time spent with ASHRAE and in the HVAC industry, Boyce has worked with worked on various projects to in increase energy efficiency. Uh, so I'd like to uh, invite now boys to, to this presentation. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. 
it's uh, truly my pleasure to to be here uh, today, and and uh, this is my second visit uh, to Lockboro, and and uh, I'm very happy to be able to do it again. So I've I've had a very uh, a very good uh, uh, volunteer career in ASHRAE, and I was fortunate enough to re represent the society in 2019-20, which was uh, a pivotal year for the world, right? It uh, turned out to be a kind of a challenging time. Now, the title of my topic is Decarbonization of Built Environment, uh, How Can ASHRAE Lead? But I'm going to give you a little background on what happened during the COVID situation. So when COVID was starting to spread throughout the world, uh, we said, how, do, how does ASHRAE help in this environment? So we created a task force um, to deal with the uh, epidemic task force. And we mobilized over 100 uh, people within our society, volunteers, that started to develop strategies, whether it was ventilation rates, filtration. Actually, it was that group that uh, uh, postulated and, and proved that uh, the virus was being spread as an airborne, uh, which the WHO eventually had to change their, uh, their recommendations around it. So ASHRAE found a way to lead in that situation. So now we're in, the, in a slightly different world. I mean, we're dealing with the, with the pandemic on an ongoing basis, and we've sort of got strategies to deal with it. But now the world's under a challenge relative to uh, climate change uh, and uh, decarbonization of the built environment is a piece of that. So the question is, how can ASHRAE lead in this challenge? And uh, so again, we put together a task force, a task force on building decarbonization. and. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what the task force has been up to, what their what their generation of, of materials is going to be, and give you a timeline for that. So I, I believe that uh, ASHRAE can lead in this area as well. So the task force is working in four what we call key focus areas. We're working on the standards to incorporate carbon, uh, recognize carbon within our standards. They're working on education programs technical tools, particularly in terms of guides. And uh, we'll talk about the various guides they're working on uh, shortly. And a position document that's been put up and has been, uh, it's kind of like with the epidemic task force, as we learn more about decarbonization, we're modifying our position document to, uh, to respond to what we're learning. So the position document is out. It can be found on our ASHRAE website. Um, and then if you go into the library about ASHRAE building and decarbonization, you can actually find the position document. So what happens with a position document in ASHRAE is that we take that and then we have a government affairs committee that, that creates a position brief. So what, what we do with the position brief is we take the key elements out of this position document, which could be 10, 12 pages, put them into a one or two page uh, document that we can give to regulators and government officials to uh, give them the give them better knowledge about a position we have on decarbonization or or healthy built environments or whatever. So this is how this plays an important role in, in our communication with government and regulatory agencies. So in the area of standards, uh, we have some very high profile standards, 90.1, which is for new construction of buildings, commercial non-residential, standard 90.2, which deals with residential buildings, standard 90.4, which is new construction for data centers, so we handle that somewhat differently than a commercial building. Standard 100 is, uh, was our standard for existing buildings. It's being modified to become a, a building performance standard for existing buildings. It's not just about how you would renovate existing buildings, but how do you analyze their performance and then move forward. Standard 211 is the commercial building audits, and that's also being worked on. And standard 240P is an ASHRAE standard for evaluating greenhouse gas emissions in the built environment. So these are areas, and every one of these standards is looking at how carbon emissions should be incorporated into the, the recommendations of the standard. So there's a lot of work going on in the in the standards background. I mentioned technical tools and they're really guides and, and we have a, a schedule for these. Uh, you can see uh, January 2023 building performance standards guide was out. 
it's available free now for download on the ASHRAE website. So if you wanted to have a look at that, you can uh, download it for free. Grid Interactive was the next one up, and that's just being finished up and should be available at the uh, decarbonization conference for the built environment in Washington, D.C. So when that conference is underway, that, that one will be available. And then the others are in a process of being developed. Uh, three of them are at about 60% review. And then the last one, which is building decarbonization ret for retrofits, is still a, a work in progress. Uh, but they're moving, moving along in this area at really high speed. It's, uh, we find that the task force are quite available to do that. Again, this is a, a look at the technical guide that's been completed, building performance standards. And it's uh, free for download. I actually hadn't got around to downloading it till today, but I went on there and it's quite easy to download. So if you want to have a look at it, uh, by all means. <laughs> and then these are what the other standards are look like that are currently in development. So we said another piece of it was education. So uh, there's building decarbonization 101 is available, sort of the fundamentals of why why we should be concerned about buildings and carbon emissions. And uh, then there's going to also be working on a 100 series for introduction to whole life carbon, steps to decarbonization, introduction to cold climate decarbonization, and introduction to efficient elect electrification. So these are all courses that are in the process of being developed and would be available. Um, I'll, I'll go on that in a little bit later. There's multiple ALI learning courses. That's ATRAE Learning Institute courses, which are three three hour program courses. Again, an introduction to decarbonization, fundamentals of decarbonization, design systems and equipment applications. And finally, a technical guide training courses are being planned for every one of our guides. So we're going to have training to support the guides as they come up, maybe a few months after. So we have a knowledge resource hub that's been prepared by that uh, task force. Yeah. And then the TFBD website is live and it's being updated on a continuous basis. Uh, ATRE goals and commitments are included. Technical guide updates as to where they are in the process or when they're available. Technical resources, decarbonization primer. Uh, also, we, we deal with some terminology around uh, uh, decarbonization and there's educational videos. The other thing that the task force is working on is a definition of uh, net zero. So there's a lot of net zero discussion going on and they feel that uh, we need to find some sort of consistent definition of net zero. Um, and they're actually working with the, uh, the White House in the United States to come up with, with some recommendations for a definition of net zero. And when that comes out, that'll be kind of interesting. So building decarbonization measures that are that they've uh, looked at and they reviewed, and we're going to talk a little bit about some specifics. But fundamentally, reuse of existing buildings is huge. Uh, and I'm going to talk a bit about that a little later and want to talk about the Astro headquarters building, but it's about using the structures and materials, reusing them whenever possible. Uh, we tried to do that at the university that I was overseeing the, the buildings and construction, and uh, it really does make a difference. Optimizing the building envelope, its orientation, ge geometry, implementing passive and active energy efficiency measures, use of waste energy. You know, try to recover as much from the waste energy as you can and put it back into the operation of the facility. Minimizing embodied carbon and new construction materials. And one of the things that we're working on uh, is, is uh, a simplified methodology to actually to calculate the embedded carbon within the uh, heating HVAC and R equipment. Um, right now, if you look at trying to calculate the embedded uh, carbon in, in maybe a, a chiller or even an air handling unit, it's like a $25,000 investment for each type. To do that, and we feel that we can come up with some ways that we can make it simplify that so that it'll be easier for the manufacturers to calculate 
embedded carbon in their equipment so that we can use that in our life cycle. Uh, use energy efficient electrification of space and water heating. Uh, low GWP refrigerants while maintaining energy efficiency. That's, that's kind of an interesting thing in terms of North America versus Europe. Uh, these mildly flammable refrigerants that are quite much, pretty much in use in Europe are struggle to get into use in, in North America, particularly the United States, because of the flammability of them. And uh, so we're we're trying to we've done a lot of research into it's we call it low flammability, mildly flammable, and and uh, we're trying to understand the risks so we can convince government agencies to modify their regulations to allow it to be used to reduce the impact on the environment. Optimize building energy storage and demand. Use renewable energy on site or off site whenever possible. And again, we'll cover that a little bit in our headquarters building project and provide effective long-term operations and maintenance. So I'm an operations and maintenance guy, right? I oversaw the buildings and construction and operations at a university. <clears throat> and if you can design a really good building, but if we don't operate it effectively, it, you lose a ton of what we could have gained by having a good building. So there's there's a lot to be said about operations and maintenance. Under, undervalued. So the uh, task force had a look at some various measures in terms of uh, what they believe are drivers on uh, decarbonization, and they they sort of judged them on their impact. And the, the number one on the uh, on the side of climate related drivers is reduce operational greenhouse emission, gas emissions, operational emissions, and that's our as ASHRAE that's our greatest impact <coughs> on a day to day basis is with operational. And then I'll jump to the organization related drivers. The top top number in there is building comfort, health and safety. So it's it's uh, actually it, it comes right in, in line with uh, the focus of my presidential year where we're building these buildings, we're operating these buildings for people. But we don't want to waste the energy. We don't want to emit more carbon than we than we can than we have to. And so that's the two drivers that I think take the top of the list in terms of drivers from those two views. Uh, then the reduce embodied carbon in building materials and equipment. And I talked a little bit about our contribution to, to understanding the, the carbon, embodied carbon in the uh, products and materials that our industry uh, installs, build and design. Uh, reduce fossil fuel use in buildings. Increase zero use of zero carbon renewable energy and increase facility resilience to climate change impacts. <clears throat> and we've seen a lot of climate change impacts. I mean, it's <coughs> all around the world. It's uh, everything from floods to wildfires uh, and in places where you don't expect it. It's uh, there's some places like in British Columbia, Canada, that wildfires are fairly, fairly relevant. Uh, but then you, you move to uh, Areas of Portugal, and that's they're getting wildfires that they didn't really have before. And then on the organizational drivers, reduce building life cycle costs, increase building asset values, maintain compliance with government regulations, and support sustainability goals and commitments for the organization. So these are some of the high profile uh, drivers that the committee has come up with. So then they started to sort of look at the uh, decarbonization practices in the area of project planning, development, construction renovation, passive efficiency, active efficiency, facilities management, and distributed energy resources. And they came up with a list of what they thought were, were some of the, the high profile ones. And then they went into that list and said, what are the top ones that they believe are important? And uh, building decarbonization audit, they felt that you really have to do that to get the baseline that you're going to be starting to test again in terms of anything you do. And then emissions reduction roadmap was very important that you start to strata, develop the strategy of how you're going to reduce those emissions. And then put that all into a facility capital planning and so that you can have a, a roadmap and an action plan to do that. So then they, they went on to project development and they felt that life cycle cost analysis is very important. And uh, it's interesting that uh, 
life cycle cost has been an issue around for many decades, right? But it's really come to the forefront of discussion lately in terms of um, its embedded carbon contribution to that. So it's uh, it's uh, definitely a high profile thing to be doing in terms of development and build, building life cycle emissions assessment. You know, how, how, how are the emissions in terms of long-term operating going to impact the environment? Under construction renovation, low carbon building materials, whether it be in the structure or in the envelope or in the in the me mechanical electrical systems, and then the use of low global warming refrigerants. Passive energy efficiency measures, building thermal envelope is important, and then building fenestration. So having a, a good mix of the, of the right amount of windows uh, in terms of, again, for the people, Remember, we build buildings for people, mostly, most of the buildings. And so you need windows so that they have uh, views and, and natural light, yet you want to have it the right size so that uh, your losses, envelope losses are reduced. Active, active efficiency measures, high performance HVAC equipment, beneficial electrification, beneficial electrification. Uh, so replacing fossil fuel systems for face heating when it will actually match your life cycle analysis and your carbon reduction targets, right? There's those two things that have to come into play. And building management and control systems, building automation. Facility management, uh, refrigerant management, building retro commissioning, so ongoing review of the building, how it's operating to ensure it's operating the way it's intended. Building education and training. And uh, Integrated facilities management, uh, as a facilities management guy, I'd say it should be high on the list as well. It's it's the fact that you need to understand uh, the maintenance and operations, the day-to-day -day operations of the ventilation system. So usually you have different groups within facilities management that have an energy management group, a data a maintenance and operations group, and you need to integrate that because uh, if they're not in sync, then often the, the building and the occupants suffer and the emissions suffer. And then distributed energy resources measure, on-site renewable energy is high, energy storage and demand management, and demand, using the flexibility of demand uh, to reduce impact. So now I'm gonna switch a little bit. So that's, that's the sort of a summary of where the uh, uh, task force on building decarbonization is today. And I'm going to switch to an example of the head, ASHRAE headquarters building that we've uh, worked on. And the background on that is that, uh, and this is the U.S. because the ASHRAE headquarters buildings in the United States, we sort of did a comparison of, of uh, the existing building space and found out that uh, in developed economies, at least half of the buildings that will be in use in 2050 have already been built. So those are a real challenge for us to get to net zero because they're already there. Uh, you can't rebuild them with low carbon uh, structures and, and envelopes. And 72% of the floor stock in the U.S. or 46 billion square feet belongs to buildings over 20 years old. So we've got an older, older building stock. It's not as old as uh, England, but it's old enough. Then. And it depends on when it was built as to how good it was. The buildings built in the 70s, you know, they're they're not necessarily top of the line. So our project goal was to renovate a 1970s building into a high performance net, net zero ready uh, facility in a cost effective method. And uh, it, it was funny because when we were doing this, uh, our executive director, Jeff Littleton, was on there. And he said, <clears throat> and, and it's absolutely true. Our organization relies on harvesting the technical knowledge, volunteer energy, and expertise of our members. We want this space to inspire visitors to participate and honor them for their volunteer service and commitment. And so it was decided that we were going to do something special. We, When we had to sell our old building, we looked at, do we lease space? Do we build a new building on, on a green space? Or do we renovate an existing building? And we felt that renovating the existing building was the demonstration that we needed needed to do for our members and and for our society <clears throat> so
So 180 Technology Parkway was the building that we purchased. Um, and we did an analysis of our space that we needed uh, for our operations. We came up with 44,000 square feet approximate. Now, if you see here, this building was 66,870. So we looked at all sorts of buildings and we we're focused on that 50,000 square foot building. And I came across this one and I said, got a good location, it's bigger than we need, and it's the least expensive. Let's go look at it. And we did, and we kind of fell in love with, uh, with the approach. So we ended up purchasing that building. So we built it a uh, three-story building. We purchased it December 2018. We bought it, and then by October 2019, we had to be out of our old building. So we didn't have much time to, to get underway with it. So we started off, we, we started following our, our recommendations in terms of, uh, of the society's recommendations around commissioning and owner project requirements. So we created an owner project requirement document and established some critical mission goals and safety, safety in an end work environment and during construction, affordability constructed within available funding, uh, exceeds ASHRAE standards, exceed applicable sta ASHRAE standards. We didn't want to want to cut any corners. We wanted to make sure we exceeded the standards. And in some cases, we, we ended up meeting them, but we, we our target was to exceed. We found out in our previous building that it, noise was a bit of a problem. We wanted to manage the acoustics and have the levels uh, better in the, in the office environments. And we wanted to be net zero ready. And what that really meant to us is we had to achieve low EUI levels so that a reasonable amount of photovoltaic could get us to net zero operation. So the specific requirements, ASHRAE 189.1, that sort of green building um, standard, we needed, we wanted to exceed those requirements. Site energy consumption, we had a target of 21.4 kilobtu per square foot per year, but we said it, we'd really like to hit 15, but we've got to at least hit the 21.4. Water efficiency was covered. Daytime plug load, we had a target of 0 0.04 watts per square foot. Uh, we wanted to in, in exceed the requirements by three to five NC for an office, standard office environment. Outside air supply, we wanted it to be 1.3 times the ASHRAE 62.1, so about 30% more ventilation. As it turns out in COVID, that was not a bad thing. Outside air control, demand control for the uh, high occupancy spaces, and I'll talk a little bit more about them later. And daylighting, majority of occupants to achieve generous daylighting 55% of the time. And then we needed to uh, make sure we handled resiliency. So project execution was kind of important to us. Uh, we decided that we we're going to use a project manager. ASHRAE doesn't have project management staff. And so the ad hoc developed a request for uh, quotation qualifications for project managers. Hired that, and we, we decided to utilize construction manager early on to get the contractor input. We did that. And then we hired a project team to implement the construction commissioning. This is the existing structure that we uh, we purchased, and it had the pretty open floor plates in terms of I mean we once you took the office the I guess the uh, drywall office spaces out it was pretty open, and then that's a mid level floor. So primary envelope factors is we we wanted to really assess the window to wall ratios so. It's important to define the optimum area of openings relative to achieving daylight while minimizing the losses through the envelope. The other thing that was critical is area filtration and insulation of that envelope. Uh, the envelope that in the building we purchased was pretty leaky and not very good. So the design team did a complete analysis of, of the existing performance. Uh, if you went to ASHRAE 90.1, although it's for new construction. We use that as a, a baseline. And then they did their calculations and recommended the 
wall assembly U values, the uh, roof assembly U values, window, window assembly, window to wall ratio at 40%, and uh, shading in terms of shading on, on, on the sides and at infiltration rates. So all that was established through a, a detailed analysis. So we ended up designing the building. After all, we sort of ran all the numbers and the window to wall ratio on the east and west was 33.5%. And the north and south, we could bring it up to 40.9%. 40 .9, and it gave us an average of that 40% for the building. So again, this gave you a sense of the uh, building envelope that we were working with was new skylights. Uh, and that allowed us to, to get hit our uh, daylighting, uh, daylighting opportunities. So 50% of the regularly occupied workspaces on the upper level uh, were properly lit with the window to wall ratios that we selected and the installation of 18 skylights. So we were able to get natural daylight into most of the occupied office areas and the internal areas were either meeting rooms or, or, or other activity areas. So how were we doing? We, uh, we actually, uh, a standard office building was uh, at 58 uh, feet per square foot per year. Uh, the existing envelope 90.1 would have would have brought us to 36. And with all the reductions that we, we ended up with, uh, we ended up with the design team through, through analysis and, and modeling saying that we should have 18.5. We, we looked at some other opportunities, uh, ground or light source uh, heat pumps. It was actually very expensive and we didn't own the lake. Uh, triple element glazing, uh, a more aggressive plug load analysis, and lighting and day lighting is the one that sort of got us where we needed to be. So how did we do that? So heating and cooling. So we, again, we we're focused on reducing the energy, but having a good thermal environment, a comfortable space for the occupants. So we decided to go with a, a, a heating and cooling panel system, ceiling panel system. Now, that, that created a bit of a problem because in Atlanta, Georgia, people never installed that. So our contractors were not familiar with how to install radiant panels. Uh, but we decided that the end product would be better if we did it. So we were prepared to pay a premium to have these radiant panels installed. So we had a, a air-cooled heat pump, heat recovery heat pump, and then it could either provide heat warm to the radiant panels or, or chill water to the radiant panels. And we had these very complex six-way valves that were designed and installed. And oddly enough, they actually work. So the other side of it was a dedicated outdoor air system. So we designed it for 30% uh, more than 62.1. And then we made sure that happened by having a dedicated outside air. So we decoupled the cooling really from the ventilation system so that we could always have that ventilation rate. The only place where we vary the ventilation rate is in the uh, learning center where we have occupant loads that are that vary quite a bit. So this was the strategy to get us to the proper ventilation. That's turned out during COVID, that was really a good feature. So we had these radiant panel clouds that were above the occupied space. Well, they, they actually were around the perimeter and they could do heating or cooling around the perimeter. And then in the interior zone, it was cooling only in a cloud kind of environment. And the ventilation was cooler neutral from the, from the DOAS unit. So it was kind of a, on the cool side of neutral so that it, it uh, provided, you could vary it slightly, but we didn't want to rely on it for cooling. So here's what our, our final office layout ended up like on the upper level. And this is the, the level that had 50%, 57% daylighting uh, in their occupied area. And you can see the occupied spaces are all around the perimeter where they got good daylighting. 
And then the uh, interior zones were either meeting rooms or print rooms or that sort of thing. And then on the middle level, <clears throat> one whole side of the building is a learning center. So we have large classrooms, small meeting rooms, smaller classrooms. And so the, the lighting was something you really end up having to control pretty much all the time. So, so to, to be able to have the proper lighting in there, we, we felt that that was fine. And then in that middle level, wherever there was occupied space, we put it beside the windows. And so again, there were meeting rooms and storage rooms that were off, off to the uh, non-window side. And then we, we really gained a, a basement or a lower level out of this, which uh, allows us ASHRAE to bring back the stories that we're paying to have, have it stored every month. And we can bring that back and we have some other space that we can uh, store or, or actually do some other activities in the building. So this gives you a sense of what it uh, looked like a little bit. We actually uh, got donated these light fixtures that are actually in the shape of our logo. And that's in our lobby. We used uh, ceiling fans so that we could uh, allow the, the temperature in the building to rise above sort of normal temperatures by creating that uh, air motion that people were still comfortable uh, in that. Although what we had to do is reverse the ceiling fans uh, during the COVID situation because it, that was the advice given by our, our task force. And and we end up, you know, we've got really an all electric building. Um, when we bought the building, it had a diesel generator um, because it was like a a competing center for storing people's important uh, files, right? So it was a a, a company that uh, store did se separate storage for other companies' uh, software and files. And when we uh, changed it all, we we got rid of a lot of the stuff that was in the mechanical room. Simplified the mechanical room and then only had uh, all electric heat pump in it. It was an interesting thing that happened. You can see the exterior of the building. Now we have some uh, some shading on the building for uh, in, in, the, in the appropriate uh, sides of the building. The, the city that we're in came along right? when we we're in construction and said, we want to build this pathway on your property. It goes around this lake. It's uh, there's a lake over here. It's it's really a, a retention lake. It's a part of the stream system, uh, and they wanted to build this pathway, so we let them do that. And it turns out that now it's an added advantage to our staff because they have this pathway they can walk around the lake and and get outside and get some exercise. Gives you a sense of the finish before we put the furniture in inside the building. So lots of windows still. Not floor to ceiling, wall to wall, uh, but just enough windows to to make it feel very comfortable. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, so we were net zero ready. So we got near the end of the project, and it's one of those rare opportunities where you have some money left in the budget. And so we we got a company in to uh, give us a cost estimate to add on-site solar. And they gave us a, an estimate. The PV was half a million site modifications would be about fifty thousand dollars. And so we we had uh, about one hundred and fifty of that. No, we had about four hundred and fifty of that in the bank in, in our project. We got approval to put another hundred thousand into it, and we signed a contract. And this is the photovoltaics that we ended up on site. So we used as much of the roof as we could, and it turned out we had. A, uh, more parking than we really needed. So we recovered some of the parking lot. So it took the parking out and put photovoltaics on a piece of it and then photovoltaics on, on a hill that was not that very useful for us. And so the, the system capacity was 331 kilowatts of DC. But the uh, Georgia Power, which is the power service that serves our building, capped us at 250 kilowatts. So we could have had 331, but they said you can't generate more than 250. So we're, we keep the capacity down to that. So with that, <clears throat> what we're doing is that, uh, so the red lines, orange on mine, the red on this, 
are, are the photovoltaic generation. And the blue lines are the, the net uh, net kilowatt hours for the building. You can see that we're we're coming pretty close to it. Now during the it's like anything when you put something new in, you have to sort of work out the kinks, and there were quite a few kinks early on uh, in sort of the 21 time frame. But we, we're getting those worked out, and it's pretty been pretty reliable now. So we're we're getting some very good results with uh, with the 250 kilowatts. So what do we see as important pieces of this renovation? retrofit, renewal, whatever you want to call it, of a 1970s building. 18 new skylights and reconfigured window wall ratio got us to uh, reducing the losses in the, in the envelope. Radiant ceiling, ceiling panel system in terms used for heating and cooling, dedicated outdoor air for ventilation. So decoupling that is, I think, important to the project. Over fre overhead fresh air distribution augmented by reversible ceiling fans. We actually ended up using, in a lot of the areas, uh, fabric duct. And the beauty of a fabric duct is that it gives you the ventilation without any dra drafts. Because it's just sort of the, all the perforations, the air comes out everywhere, but doesn't come out at a high velocity. So that, uh, that works very well. Six uh, water source heat pumps and four on the basement level, two in the upper level, we used to condition these spaces sort of independent from the building. Building automation system remotely access. A robust IT backbone network. So as we were um, planning the building, we had a um, IT company come to, to see us and they, they offered to install a, a very uh, um, robust backbone network for, uh, to donate it. And so we have that. So we have the ability to connect everything through this backbone network in terms of the lighting, the building automation, and uh, just just about anything that goes through. Command control ventilation for the eye occupancy areas, and then on-site electrical vehicle charging stations available for guests and staff. So we're able to actually install four charging stations today with the capacity to uh, to expand that in the future. Sort of looking to the future of electrical, electric vehicle use. So that gets you to a building that's finished, that's turned over. <clears throat> now what? And I, I can tell you, it's in my experience, a lot of buildings, group buildings, well-designed, well-built, are turned over, and then they just don't operate the way they, they should. So we decided to continue our ad hoc uh, and we're looking at smart buildings. What role does that play? Building analytics and fault detection. Building intelligence evaluation using our building EQ or building IQ intelligence. And then demonstration use of automated system optimization. So sort of taking the analytics and, and then it generates, uh, generates recommendations for how you would modify the controls. Building EQ evaluation and then IEQ monitoring. So smart buildings is something that uh, I've, I've been involved with for quite a few years now. And it's really about effectively maximizing and assessing sustainability in the smart building requires actionable insights. You need, you need data, but then you need to have the insights from the data to actually, actually decide what to do about it. So smart buildings generate a lot of data, uh, tons of data actually in effect, but this data needs to uh, to be analyzed and then some direction come out of it to de deliver sustainability. And number one focus is we can't really manage what we don't measure and what we don't analyze. The use of analytics in the built environment creates a shift from reactive to proactive maintenance opportunities. One benefit is to reduce the amount of time it takes to diagnose issues and shift that time to fixing the problem. Uh, the application analytics does not reduce maintenance hours, and uh, but it can actually reduce energy consumption because you're catching the things that are out of line in time to actually save uh, energy. So it's uh, something that analytics also makes it possible to understand if a, a previously 
unknown energy saving. If previously known energy savings opportunities, the solutions are tracked. Previous energy savings initiatives verified through energy savings plus achieve additional index needs. Monitoring based commissioning and measurement verification. So if you'd actually make it, take an initiative to reduce energy, you can actually through the analytics monitor if that's actually effective or not. And uh, that's one of the key elements. So what we we have experience with is that uh, we're, we're getting increased energy efficiency reporting, improved occupant comfort and safety, uh, reduced maintenance costs. Now still early in the building life to uh, to say that, and full on equipment and capital upgrades. So we look at building EQ. So this is ASHRAE's program. And it's a free web based portal. And benchmarks energy performance, calculates building EUI based on the climate zone, includes operational carbon metrics, and assists in the ASHRAE level one energy audit, which allows you to look at the building and say, what could we do to reduce our energy use and or carbon emissions? It provides data to improve energy efficiency. So the building EQ level one energy audit is uh, starts with an in-operation assessment, uses metered real metered data, reflects how the building is designed, used and operated. Most common application. There's as designed rating. Um, there's a few flaws with that one, and uh, but the building EQ for in-operation assessment actually is, is very effective. And it has a rating from zero, which is net energy to 200, which is a very inefficient uh, building. and allows for tracking of, of improvements and comparing itself over time. So how the headquarters building do? Well, right now we have a building EQ energy score of three, not zero yet. Uh, we believe that the initiatives we're working on in terms of the building operation will get us to zero, uh, but there's still some fine tuning. Buildings are more complex than one would like to think. Uh, source EUI of seven, median EUI of 223, building EQ carbon performance rating of 3.2, so three on the energy, 3.2 on carbon, and total emissions per condition space, 3.46 pounds per year per square foot. So that's a, a, a quick run through what ASHRAE is doing directly to reduce carbon emissions. It's uh, both a, a task force and our demonstration project. The ASHRAE headquarters building is, is a living lab for what we're doing. Uh, so we're, we submeter everything. So we can actually tell if we're missing our targets on the lighting or, or the pump, pump uh, energy use uh, on the uh, DOAS units on the on the heat recovery chillers. So it, it's um, it's really good. Right now we're having some issues with the building automation system. It's not generating information on on their on their on our website the way it should. So we're working on getting that sorted out. Uh, but it's uh, we're gonna go live with the living lab openly probably in the next six months. Right now you can find it. But you have to kind of look for it. We're actually going to publicize how to how to go and look at the building operation in the, in the coming months. So that's uh, an update on where we are in terms of uh, of uh, building decarbonization and and whether or not uh, ASHRAE can lead. Uh, I think it's up to you to decide whether you think ASHRAE can lead and how you can be part of that. Uh, it's uh, it's a great opportunity. Uh, society needs everybody to work towards this end, and ASHRAE has jumped in. Uh, our current president, Ginger, is uh, challenge accepted. Um, so our society has accepted the challenge. And in any group of 55,000 people, there's going to be people that don't believe that carbon emissions are a problem, but the majority are do, and, and the majority are working towards the solutions. Um, and uh, our task force has the rest of this year, and then we have to 
to take all the activities that they're doing and, and distribute them somewhere in the ASHRAE organization so that we will continue to work in these areas. So there, there you have it. And uh, thank you for uh, listening to me. And it's been a pleasure to be here. Yeah, is there questions? Yes. What do you mean by net zero ready? Well, it, it really meant that what we were trying to do is is get. It's kind of like building for the people that are going to be in the building and then having the energy utilization as low as possible. So we we're focused on the indoor environment. We wanted it to be safe, healthy and comfortable. And then to do that, we were looking for systems that would give us the least amount of energy use. So for us, that was net zero ready and, and we hit a target. Through our analysis, we said 21 KBTUs was a, a good target. And that would put us in a position where we could purchase green electricity or have photovoltaics on site that would get us to net zero. Our operation right now is around uh, just under 19. And we hope to make that a little better with our, our building operations. There's a question on the chat. Um, is the task force um, working on collaborating with regional bodies, for example, in UK TIPC, to make these measures applicable outside of North America? Yeah, so they have membership uh, um, representing from uh, CIPC. And it's interesting, the uh, PM65 CIPC methodology for embedded carbon is actually being used by the task force and they're recommending people now until we have some more some simplified methods to actually use that to uh, to calculate their carbon. So it, it's a. Uh, this is a challenge, a worldwide challenge that I think we all have to, to work towards. And ASHRAE has a, a technical capacity that's kind of interesting because we have uh, consulting engineers, we have academics, we have researchers, we have uh, manufacturers, we have contractors that are all members that that uh, contribute to our, our technical advice. And uh, so I think that that it gives us a broad range of views which is helpful. It's also complicated. <laughs> but in the end, I think better better technical advice comes out of it. What was the main challenge that you faced building the new building? Well, the main challenge actually it was interesting because uh, we built it in the middle of COVID, right? Yeah. And uh, it was uh, one of those things where we had to uh, to deal with that. We had budget. The original budget uh, uh, was was tight, right? So we had to actually go back to the board and ask for a bit more money uh, to get the building built the way we wanted it to provide that indoor environment and also have the systems and reduce the energy consumption. So that was really sort of the challenge was getting that getting our our, our requirements to actually meet a budget. And then we were fortunate enough that the uh, <clears throat> The board saw the value in, in enhancing the design and then gave us the extra money that we needed. And then once we had that revised budget, we were good. And as I said, we had money left over to uh, to move towards the potable ticks. So. But it's uh, if you ever have a chance to go there, make sure you do because it's 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 quite remarkable. Did you make it uh, against <coughs> COVID? How did you make to Combat COVID in the building? Uh, well, a good part of it was during construction. So the contractor had to have special processes. He had cleaning stations for people to clean them, clean their hands and everything before they went in. They had uh, they had health and safety people on there every day. They had had requirements for working in the building for the contractors. And then when we got into the building, of course, it was uh, most people were working from home everywhere. So there was a transition there where we didn't really have the occupancy levels to uh, to worry too much about. And now we're sort of transitioning back into more normal operations. But the interesting thing about it, and I, I think it's happened everywhere, is that people now, there's, there's a, a, a dynamic of people that can really effectively work from home versus people that should be in the office. And then we're starting to get diverse sort of uh, occupancies now. ASHRAE is just part of that story, right? Of, 
if people can effectively do their work from home, then they're they're being given the opportunity to do that. And of course, there's there's a few days they have to be in the office because that's all part of that inter interaction connection. Uh, but they can work some days from home pretty much every week. Why is the concept of decarbonization particularly important when we have a new trading system or other green building trading system focusing on existing uh, certification of existing buildings? So those kind of certification also helps us reduce the carbon footprint eventually. So why is this particular term so important and why do we need to follow this? Well, they do. I, I, any uh, rating system that, uh, that gives you a, a sustainable energy efficient building actually typically reduces carbon emissions unless they've got green electricity is what they're using in the neighborhood. I would say that it's important to focus on it because there's other things that come out of it. Like, uh, first of all, people haven't really thought about embedded carbon in mechanical systems. So now we're looking at that. How, how do you how do you evaluate how much carbon it took to create this air handling unit? How much carbon's embedded in that? So we've opened our our sort of world to uh, thinking more than just energy and more than just uh, the cost of a building and whether whether it's uh, sustainable in terms of the materials that are used in terms of their, you know, like bamboo floors and all that sort of thing. Uh, so I think decarbonization is important for us to look at from an operational point of view. And, and if you if you look at it and say, what motivates people, right? And, and if you're a building owner, uh, there's a few things that motivate you. Sometimes getting a plaque is to motivate you. And I don't think there's very many building owners, so that really motivates them. Uh, but what motivates you is is what's a cost, and governments are are acting on on carbon emissions, right? They're they're making expensive to use carbon. Um, so what's going to happen is the building owners are going to say, well, I have to manage this this risk, and decarbonization is part of that risk management. And I think so. Once you get that, so we're working with uh, example for our decarbonization conference in Washington D.C. We're working with IFMA, BOMA, AIA, and APA, which represents higher education, to say, well, how do we work together to tackle this problem? How do we work together to effectively reduce carbon emissions? So the building owner organizations are recognizing that this is important. And ASHRAE is, is being recognized as being the organization that's there to help. And not just in new construction, right? In existing buildings. So you mentioned that uh, you worked, with, worked on photovoltaics after you had uh, 450,000 dollars left. Why was it one of the last priorities? Why didn't you focus on it? Well, because we uh, we wanted to get a building that was ready to be net zero. We, di we didn't at the beginning say we're going to have a net zero building because we didn't think we had enough money. Mm -hmm. So it's again, build, with, build within the available resources. It's, it's, job one, but we didn't want to, it's it's like being ready to be uh, electrification, be ready for electrification. It, it's it's that journey that you got to take that first step. And our first step was have a good indoor environment, that uh, reduced energy consumption, and be ready to buy green energy, put photovoltaics on. We didn't actually think we could afford the photovoltaics. Turned out we, uh, that was a, actually a pretty good deal for that amount of photovoltaics. So the company that did it, wanted us as a demonstration project as well. So I think they gave us a discount. Two questions in the chat. Uh, the first one is, what are your thoughts regarding hydrogen gas-fired solutions for heating the domestic hot water compared with the all electric ones? I actually don't have any thought. I haven't had a chance to give that any thought, actually. Um, but I do believe, I believe in, um, how would I say the transition to electrification? And the transition will rely on cleaner resources, maybe natural gas, hydrogen, uh, before we can we can actually electrify everything because the systems won't handle it. Uh, I know in Canada, our, our electric distribution systems, we have provinces in Canada that are primarily green electricity, problems of Quebec, problems of British Columbia. Um, and so they're trying to move as much things as possible from gas-fired to electric uh, heat pump systems. But 
if they really look at it, their electoral distribution wouldn't handle it. Everybody did it, but they've got a program to, to migrate. So it's it's one of those solutions that I think can be be important in that transition. Hybrid solutions, uh, if, if you're going to do something, renovate a building, and you, you don't feel that you can go to an electrical solution today, set it up so it's easy to do that while you've got it under construction, right? The second one is, are there any specific demand flexibility controls like <coughs> need HVAC particularly for heat pumps in the HQ building? Um, it's a little uh, outside of my uh, my technical controls realm. Minimum requirements or grid regulations. Well, yeah, I know there's grid regulations all over the place, and they're all over the map. Um, and that's part of. It's all part of what the, you know. Ashray's government affairs side is trying to deal with the government agencies, whether it be uh, uh, countries, states, provinces, um, and and they're trying to uh, find solutions that the government can in, in, in can actually implement, so that we can be be working towards the right ends. Um, some governments are very receptive to decarbon. You want to go talk about decarbonization with it? Well, please come and talk to us because it's important to us. Others are kind of on the fence. And uh, so we're trying to get everybody aware of what the issues are and what can be done. And if regulations are part of the solution, then hopefully they'll listen to us and modify them. There's an interesting story from uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. So I was out there on a on a visit to a chapter, and I, I met with uh, both their, the sustainability group that's pushing for heat pumps and you know, convert natural gas to heat pumps, and then the other group was the the group that was in charge of the sort of water management, and uh, they were concerned about Legionella, so they uh, they they told us that uh, they have a permit system in the city that if you're gonna if you operate a fountain or a cooling tower or hot water distribution systems, you have to have a permit that says you're properly qualified to do that. And I said, well, it's amazing. And, and so what they said is, and so we have this, and, and there, there's, we're using the ASHRAE guide for uh, for the requirements. He said, and we, uh, but we can't really use 90.1, he says, because they're not consistent. So here's from an, an end sort of regulator saying you've got a guide that says this, you have a standard that says that. So we believe the guide, but we don't believe the standard. So anyway, I, I got a copy of it and I, I looked at it and and you know it was interesting. It was an interpretation. It said in in the in the in the the guide that you had to have the water temperature in the in a hot water system uh, where you're storing it above 140 degrees C. In in the in the standard, it said um, something about having it under 120 degrees, but it's standard related to when you use it at the tap. But they interpreted it to be the, the storage, right? Because it said uh, uh, flow from the storage has to be under 120 degrees, and so I've I've sent that back to the standard a member of the standards committee and said, you know, you got to you got to clarify this. If you, you mean the water as it comes out of a tap, you better say that. Otherwise, it's being misinterpreted. So that's our ability as ASHRAE to say, OK, we work with governments and regulatory agencies to, to help them uh, apply our standards and guidelines effectively. There's another question. Um, <laughs> uh, within the bill, the same, I'm guessing for the yeah, the, the ASHRAE HQ. Within the building's data analytics, is there any current or future plan usage of artificial intelligence to support energy saving IQ? Yeah, and that's uh, that's one of the things I mentioned where we're, we're using, uh, we have a, a company that's donated the analytics and fault detection, and they're actually looking at, uh, they have another feature product that actually takes all that information, analyzes what can be done with the building automation system to reduce energy or carbon emissions or, or impact positively on the indoor environment. And so that's 